Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor for Paws International. Our very last session is going to be on the tail of the wind, development and maintenance of a disaster response team. It's gonna be presented by Dr. Clayton McCook of uh, equine sports medicine and surgery in the USA, and Josh Mazerhead. He is the public information officer and training officer at OLAFRA in the USA. It's a privilege to have you gentlemen presenting today. Take it away. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for the honor of asking us to do this, and, and it's a privilege to be here. Um, our presentation is on the tail of the wind, and we're gonna to talk to you about the development and maintenance of a disaster response team. We're gonna talk about the origins of our response team, which is the Oklahoma Large Animal First Responders. I'm gonna start with a video today that is gonna be how, we, how our organization got started. And that is on May 20th, 2013. There's no audio on this video, but I want you to just uh, take a look and imagine the gentleman who's filming this is, is quite concerned as the video starts and as the tornado grows in size and grows closer and closer to his house, to his home, you start to see the debris flying in the air. You get an idea of the, the size of this tornado. It was just absolutely massive and destructive. Um, and so again, as you start to see uh, some of the debris flying, you kind of get a picture of what exactly this storm did uh, to central Oklahoma particularly to the city of Moore and the surrounding areas. If you've never been in an EF4 or EF5 tornado, I, I really hope you never are. Personally, I never have. Um, I've been in the aftermath of several of them um, within 20, 30, 45 minutes after, and the damage is, is really unspeakable. Um, there's not really a way to describe it accurately. The, the sounds, the smells, what it looks like, uh, on the ground. Um, the video gives you a sense with things flying through the air, the large objects and debris flying through the air, but it really doesn't do justice to what it's like to be on the ground in the aftermath of one of those. So this is just a quick radar loop that shows uh, where exactly the tornado started and as it progressed. And so just to orient yourself more is just south of Oklahoma City. Oklahoma is in the central, south central part of the United States, north of Texas, which you're probably familiar with. And the tornado moved in a northeasterly direction, starting southwest of Moore, um, just outside of Newcastle, and then again, moving in a northeasterly direction. So there's the damage path for this tornado. It started down in uh, Newcastle, and then it <clears throat> crossed the river here and then continued in a northeasterly direction. So the overall rating of EF5 was given to that tornado and, and EF5, the EF scale goes from zero to five with five obviously being the most destructive. Um, it's not as simple as, a, as the hurricane scale. Um, it has to do not just with wind speed, but the amount of damage and the type of area that it hits. And so uh, EF5 tornadoes are, are relatively rare, but they are by far the worst. And so that affected Newcastle, uh, the south part of Oklahoma City, and the town of Moore uh, in McLean and Cleveland County. So the tornado had a length of about 14 miles. It was on the ground for approximately 40 minutes. It started at right just uh, short of three o'clock in the afternoon and went until 3.35. So at its maximum, this tornado was 1.3 miles or 2.1 kilometers in width. The peak wind speed was measured at 210 miles an hour. There were 25 documented human fatalities plus one indirect fatality, and there were 212 injuries. There was an estimated amount of damage of US $2 billion with 1,150 homes completely destroyed. So when that tornado was actually just a little bit below EF5, it was at the EF4 level, which are 166 to 200 mile uh, winds, that hit Orr Family Farm and the Celestial Acres training stable. So I became involved in this response as a spontaneous untrained volunteer. I am a practicing veterinarian. My, my practice specialty is racetrack medicine. And so I had multiple 
clients, friends, people who were living at the Celestial Acres Training Center, who are training their horses and then bringing them up to Remington Park, where I work in the spring to race their horses. So immediately after three o'clock p.m., my phone started ringing with calls and, and frantic text messages saying that Celestial Acres had taken a direct hit and that they needed help. So those of us who got those calls um, tried to make our way down there. Um, this is a difficult thing for me to think about in hindsight, because in essence, it is self-deployment. But as a veterinarian, I, I live in that gray area where it wasn't just self-deployment going down to a disaster scene. It was actually responding as a private practice veterinarian to my clients who were in need and who were asking for my help. So just to give you an overall picture of how many cattle, uh, horses, things like that, livestock we have in Oklahoma. In 2013, a study at Oklahoma State estimated that there are about 4.1 million cattle in Oklahoma. And in 2013, Dr. Chris Heine did a study through, again, through Oklahoma State that estimated there are around 252,000 horses in Oklahoma. So the, we would have had about the same number in 2013. So we obviously have other large animal species that are related to agriculture. We have sheep, goats, llama, alpaca, in addition to hundreds of thousands of head, additional uh, heads statewide. And those are from the USDA. So these spontaneous untrained volunteers, including veterinarians like myself, veterinary technician, horse owners, property owners, and others, we did our best to assist law enforcement and emergency responders in the immediate response. And so, as you can imagine, the aftermath of an EF5 tornado is quite chaotic. And you have all types of people um, ranging from press, you know, media people trying to get in and get video and interviews to obviously law enforcement, emergency responders going to help. And then the people who live there who are trying, in many cases, were at work at that time of day, their children were in school, and they were trying to get back to their homes to see if there was anything left. And so it, it was quite a chaotic scene. And so I was able to get to the scene by simply showing my Oklahoma veterinary license. That was the only credential that I had. I had no training. I had no background in emergency response. That's a huge failure uh, on my own part because I was woefully unprepared for what I would find. And so thankfully, because they had you know, been communicated that there was a need that this large training center had been hit and there were multiple injuries and fatalities of horses, we were actually not just allowed in, but in some cases welcomed in through the different checkpoints and to uh, through the different um, staging areas that law enforcement had set up. And so I made my way to Celestial Acres and uh, I talk about this a lot and it's been 10 years, but it doesn't get any easier. But some of the scenes that I saw there, I, I will spend the rest of my life trying to get those images out of my head because the damage was just horrific. And there were just multiple, multiple horses strewn throughout this field um, with just horrible injuries, many of them already dead, some of them still alive, but just in, in need of care, and in many cases in, in simple need of euthanasia. So we did our best at that initial scene right there at Celestial Acres, and then we literally started making our way house by house, um, the neighborhood across the um, street from the training center had horses that had been picked up and carried into that or had, found their way, they had run scared into that, they were injured. And then we just continued to make our way throughout that area. If, if you picture in your mind's eye, this area is semi, um, it's urban, suburban, but it also has a rural aspect. So many of these places have three, four, five acres. Um, people keep a handful of horses, in some cases, some cattle. And so we literally went door to door. Uh, we did our best to, to treat the victims that we could in the field where they needed it. And then we tried to evacuate as many as possible. Many of the evacuees went to local veterinary hospitals and, and most of those went to Equicenter Veterinary Hospital in Norman, which is just the next town south of Moore. Um, and so we literally worked into the night uh, trying to evacuate these horses, cattle, other animals. And then once we got to Equicenter, we had tried to assist Dr. Wiley the best we could with cleaning wounds, stitching wounds, just taking care of these animals. And in some cases, continuing the, the euthanasia process when uh, animals that had been evacuated had injuries that were just too severe, that were just not sustainable with life. 
So this was all done without an agency having jurisdiction taking charge or command. Um, that was a very difficult thing because it was all of us just sort of doing our best to work together on the fly without a specific incident commander or uh, any of the people that you would typically have in an organized response leading the way. And so the next day after that, we, we stayed at, at Dr. Wiley's clinic till three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, I don't remember, but we, we started going back immediately because we knew that there was a continued need for triage, evacuation, and euthanasia in some cases. We did our best to make contact with local officials, um, the State Department of Agriculture, the USDA official, the federal officials who had come in, uh, federal veterinarians who had come in. We tried to find who those people were. Um, at this stage of my career, and now having been involved with Oklahoma Large Animal First Responders for 10 years, I know who all of our state officials are. I know all of our USDA officials and veterinarians. I have their cell phones. I, I understand the way the system works in Oklahoma, then I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything. And so it was a real helpless feeling for myself and a lot of the volunteers. Because again, as I mentioned, we didn't have a specific incident command related to the large animals. The small animal response was pretty streamlined. Um, I wasn't involved in that. So I don't know for sure if they had a specific incident commander, but I know from talking to veterinarians and other volunteers that were involved with the small animal side, um, the overall response for them was much more organized than the large animal side. So we just continued our efforts in, in those days following. Um, uh, a lot of supplies started pouring in. We had uh, hay, feed, water, buckets, halters. It, it was amazing the generosity that people showed. And so part of our efforts involved getting those supplies out to the people in need, the people that had been affected that have horses and cattle and, and other animals that were injured and affected by this terrible storm. So this is one of the few graphic images I'm going to show you. I try to limit uh, the shock value of this because I don't think it's completely necessary, but I do want to give you a sense of what we were dealing with in terms of the scale and the number of horses that were killed. Uh, most estimates were north of 200 horses that were either immediately killed by the storm or had to be euthanized. And so this is as the cleanup is progressing and the federal government had come in to assist with the disposal of the carcasses. And so that, that just gives you a, a small sense of what we were dealing with here in terms of scale. So just 10 days later, um, we had another event just like this, just 40 miles down the road. Uh, it was a, uh, another large destructive EF5 tornado in the El Reno area, which is west of Oklahoma City. And again, this was just all repeated again, several large animal properties affected, and then we just had similar efforts to the May 20th response using volunteers uh, through social media and the network that we had established. Again, no specific incident command, no agency having jurisdiction taking control of the large animal response. And so as we moved into the summer and tornado season ended and efforts in, in more in El Reno war wound down, we began to have discussions about establishing a large animal emergency response team. And I have to admit, I was very skeptical of that. As, as a veterinarian, I was concerned about my professional reputation. I did not want to be involved in a group that would be uh, self-deploying and going out and getting in the way. And it was clear that we had played a huge role and that we had helped a lot of it, and that a team was needed. I was very concerned about the process of that. Um, so I agreed to move forward in terms of talking to some of our governmental and recognized NGOs that could possibly assist us with legitimacy. And so we initially met with the Oklahoma Medical Reserve Corps, which is a wonderful organization and one I care deeply about. And so the way the Medical Reserve Corps works is it has state-run units throughout the U.S. It was started after 9-11 um, as a way for medical and healthcare professionals who wanted to volunteer uh, to be able to have sort of a, a central clearinghouse and database uh, to identify us, check our credentials and training, and assign us to the right place at the right time. And so while the primary targets human health care, the MRC also has units de dedicated to uh, indirectly assisting humans via animal care. And so it seemed like a perfect fit to us. And so we met with the Medical Reserve Corps initially. We also met with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture. 
We met with uh, officials in the Oklahoma City Department of Emergency Management. We met with uh, people at Oklahoma State University, which is just about an hour north of Oklahoma City. And so the key for us was to establish as many contacts as we could and, and to try to establish some legitimacy. And so I asked two questions when I would go in these meetings. And, and the first question I would ask is, is it possible to start an organization like that? And I told them if the answer was no, then I would walk away immediately. And if the answer was yes, then I wanted to know how, because I was very concerned with, again, being perceived as a self-deploying type of group that was going to show up and get in the way. And, and we didn't want to um, exclude the excuse the cliche, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We just wanted to sort of bridge that gap uh, between the public and private sector and to just try to help out the best that we could. And so we decided that um, with a partnership with the Medical Reserve Corps that we would be an entity under the umbrella of the Medical Reserve Corps, uh, but be a separate entity. And so we incorporated and we registered as our own nonprofit 501c3 charity which in the U.S. allows us issuance of tax receipts for donations, as well as making our uh, other tax matters simple. And so we set up a board of directors with an executive. We have a president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. We established bylaws. And one of the important things that I think we did early on is that we established through our bylaws that no member should ever receive any type of payment. This is a strictly volunteer organization. And so some of the things that we've learned along the way, some of these the hard way, uh, you certainly wanna have enough board members, but you don't wanna have too many. Uh, too many can give way too many conflicting ideas and you can lose focus. Uh, and then at the same time, if you have too few board members, you can overwork the minority of your members. People get burned out and leave because they're doing all the work. And so we've also found that in order to achieve the best results, we need a diverse board. We need a, a mixture of views. And I believe we've achieved that. We have myself who has obviously a veterinary background. We have another veterinarian who is uh, primarily a small animal veterinarian. We have some Oklahoma cowboys. We have a California transplant. And we even took a British guy on um, just to really make sure that we were nice and diverse. And so I think it's really important for you to think about as you establish your board members, as you establish your team, figure out what's the best place for everybody. Not everybody needs to be out in the field doing triage and evacuation. Not everybody needs to answer the phone. Certainly not everybody needs to be talking to the press. And so this is just a process that, that takes time. And so for us, as we grew, we had new board members join, wanted that had heard about our organization and came on board, wanted to uh, introduce some new ideas. We had others that would step away as we became more educated and more established. And so it just was a process over time. And so it's really important to have regular meetings, uh, even if they're brief. COVID taught us that we can do a lot online. So we very often meet online because we're, we all live in Oklahoma, but in some cases we're two, three hours away from each other. And so even those brief online meetings are important to keep the board involved and keep the members interested. And so our board consists of, of the most trained members and that, that's our key strike team. Um, because we talk to each other most often. And so that's a, that's a group of seven typically um, that is, we are the ones that are going out initially when we do get a, um, a request. And so we also have a volunteer database, which consists of about 160 individuals. And these include veterinarians, horse owners, ranchers throughout Oklahoma. We maintain this database ourselves. Um, it's a list of the people's individual availability, the resources they have and all that. And one thing that's really important to our organization, you cannot be a member of Oklahoma Large Animal First Responders unless you're a credentialed member of the Oklahoma Medical Reserve Corps. And that's really important because it, it ensures that people have undergone a background check, they're registered, we know who they are, we know where they live. And it also provides us considerable protection from a liability standpoint. And so we try our best to keep our volunteers updated with a newsletter and any trainings that we've had available. So over time, um, we've really tried to develop, you know, to build on that original plan of creating an organization with professional behavior. And so we really tried to train the best we can. We tried to reach out to other organizations, such as the team from Louisiana, the folks at ASAR and Code 3 have been really instrumental in providing training for us. We have a great relationship with the team at Texas A&M University from which I graduated. And then of course, Rebecca's group, the TLAAR group has been absolutely crucial 
Um, Rebecca has been a tremendous resource to us. She's really provided a lot of guidance for us along the way. And that's really helped us to improve in terms of understanding our, our protocols and techniques. And so originally we kind of had an unwritten understanding of how our response would proceed. But over time, we realized we really needed to streamline that and develop some, some procedures. And so we, uh, several years ago, developed our standard operating guidelines and we went with that terminology instead of standard operating procedures, we felt that guidelines would give us a degree of flexibility to be able to adapt a little bit better. And so this framework has really helped us and, and it's been further developed to uh, create another document called the, our shelter uh, standard operating guidelines for use with that specific aspect of our responses. And so from the very start, our, our hallmark, our key that we, really impress upon our volunteers and our board members that we won't self-deploy under any circumstances. It's not going to happen unless we get a specific request through the Medical Reserve Corps or the Department of Agriculture, we will not go out in a response. And, and that can be frustrating to the public because they know of a need, they hear of a need, and they say, well, why aren't you guys there? Well, we don't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Disaster response is not effective when you have self-deploying groups going out and getting in the way and creating danger for themselves. And so that's something that we just really, really um, stress to everybody that we talk to. Uh, funding has been not always easy for us, but we've certainly been successful. Um, as an NGO, we, we don't qualify for any routine funding. Uh, so we have to go out and seek grants and donations, and, and we've been very blessed and fortunate, and, and there's been several organizations over the years that have um, really stepped up and, and donated to our cause, and, and some of those, you can see their logos here. We've gotten quite a bit of money from the AAP Foundation, from my practice, um, and just a variety of foundations like the Kirkpatrick Foundation. Uh, the ASPCA has provided some very generous grants to us. So we've been very fortunate over the years to receive some very um, generous donations. Talking about in-kind donations, those uh, typically flood in when we do have a major disaster, especially. And that can be great, but can also be really difficult. So logistically, it can be really hard to deal with, you know, semi loads full of hay or shavings or halters, buckets, things like that. So um as Josh put in our slide very effectively, kindness carries complications with it. And so managing all of these different donations, while they're, uh, we're very grateful to receive them, they can also be uh, create some difficulty in terms of the logistics of getting them to the people in need. And so over time, um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we really tried to stress training wherever possible. And so our, our core strike team members, we really try to seek out training and, and train together wherever possible. Uh, we work towards periodic exercises and training sessions with our general men membership. As most of you, uh, all of you, I'm sure have experienced, COVID certainly set us back. Uh, the, pandem the pandemic made it difficult for us to meet in person. A lot of our trainings that we had had scheduled were either post postponed or canceled. Um, but we still make every effort to get out where we can and, and train with these groups who, you know, like I mentioned, like Rebecca's group, who just do such a great job with the practical aspects of emergency response. And so in terms of equipment, um, we really try to match the knowledge level of what we have with the, you know, with our team members. And so there's a real temptation to get lots of high level equipment at the start and then learn how to use it later. We prefer to learn first and then get the equipment later. And so this is sort of the order that we we obtained our equipment. We started with a livestock trailer. Then we went towards uh, straps, basic extrication equipment, including radios, then on to a shelter trailer and equipment, then a response trailer for extrication equipment. And then we moved on into more advanced equipment, including a Becker sling. So Obviously, veterinarians are very important, um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm a veterinarian, but um, if you're going to be your disaster response team involving animals, it, it's inevitable that you're going to see injured animals. And so we have very specific veterinary laws in this country, um, and they vary state to state. And so we have to be really careful uh, with the you know, carrying of certain drugs, administering certain drugs, and things like that. And so we decided that all of our deployments should be performed with a licensed veterinarian included as part of the initial strike team. Um, it's fortunate that I'm a veterinarian, that we also have other volunteer, volunteers who are veterinarians, 
but it's really difficult to recruit my colleagues. We're very busy typically, and, and we have a difficult time sometimes um, getting free from our professional responsibilities to be able to help. And so exposure, you know, getting the word out um, is, is not always easy. Um, one of the key things that we work on is to try to go to those authorities having jurisdiction, those agencies having jurisdictions to let them know that we're out here, uh, what we're capable of, what we'd like to achieve. And we always make the point, we can't respond unless we get a request from them. And so while the Department of Agriculture and the Medical Reserve Corps are aware of us, um, it's best that the initial boots on the ground who issue the request uh, early in the response are familiar with us and our work. And so we do our best to try to get out and give presentations to emergency managers, um, their organizations, law enforcement, fire department groups, and then also offer basic large animal response training to, to people like that. And so all the time we hear, we wish and we'd known about you earlier after we get a late deployment at, at the request of one of these agencies. And so we continue to work on publicity and, and exposure. And so on that note, uh, creating awareness in the emergency manager community is only one aspect of survival. We've, we've got to continue to build our volunteer membership. We've got to maintain our public awareness. So we utilize social media through platforms such as Facebook. We utilize email newsletters. And then our public information officer becomes really important to uh, ensure our continuity and accuracy of our information. We definitely don't want six different versions um, going out there. Uh, and so it's really important to streamline that. And so in terms of publicity, we also try to really uh, educate the public. Part of our mandate is disaster education and mitigation. And so we do uh, things like microchip clinics where we'll go out and, and place microchips in horses for low cost. Uh, we do a lot of lectures and presentations wherever possible. And then we continue to try to promote our uh, safe practices via social media. So again, the, the necessary evil is publicity. And so as we need to all remember, somebody's always watching, somebody always has a camera, somebody always, you know, every cell phone has a camera now. And so we have to be really careful when we're out deploying and when we're talking to people to know that eyes are always on us. And so where are we now as I wrap up? I know I only have a couple minutes left. And so um, we're 10 years out from those horrific scenes that I started my presentation with, and we've come a long way. Uh, we've been able to deploy to multiple tornadoes, fires, floods, hurricanes. Um, we, we recognize we're still on the learning curve. We still have a long way to go in terms of building our team. Um, we maintain that we're a disaster response team. We don't have any intention of changing that, but we do get called for those small non-disaster incidents that are outside our mandate. And so we've had to learn how, how to navigate those waters and manage, um, you know, maybe being available over the phone to assist or even on scene to assist, but not in the same capacity as, as we do disaster response. And so there's no such thing as bad publicity, but um, we need to be prepared to avoid it by being of assistance when possible, but maintaining our protocols. And so in the future, um, while we've achieved what we wanna be in terms of being a part of the state animal response team, we continue to wanna build greater membership numbers. We wanna to continue to improve awareness and acceptance within the emergency management community, improve our training, improve our funding. Um, and then we would love to have no need for the organization because there are no disasters, but we all know, particularly with climate change, that's just not gonna happen. And so in summary, um, you know, forming a team from scratch is possible. It takes a lot of hard work and dedication. You'll make a lot of mistakes along the way, but it's really important to create a specific structure and mandate, incorporate that and develop it and create your standard operating guidelines and follow them to the best of your ability. It's really important to connect with and become a part of any existing organizations. Again, don't reinvent the wheel. It's important to follow your national, state, and local ordinances. Uh, for legitimacy, because legitimacy is critical. You cannot self-deploy or fall into other amateur um, traps. It's important to get veterinarians um, involved wherever possible. It's important to have a screening system for your membership. I mentioned the background checks of Medical Reserve Corps. And it's important to recognize that over time, change is going to happen. So continue to train to keep your team sharp. Don't take on too much. Grow as you learn and learn as you grow. Try to get your, the word out to the public and emergency managers as much as possible what you're available 
to do, but you're capable of and do your best to educate um, on prevention and, and preparedness. And so we're happy to share and discuss our experiences. You can reach us by email, uh, presentations at olafer.org. You can send us a uh, message through our Facebook page. And uh, we just really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys today and, and happy to take any questions. That was fantastic, Clayton. I think your, can you put your last slide up, the summary slide? Yes. The fantastic slide is really that has a lot of implications for the entire GAD MC. <laughs> I really like particularly the part in the, when you, when you uh, go back one more slide, the summary slide. Okay. Yep. Perfect. That, that, uh, cause we're going to be rolling into, uh, Dr. Steve Glassy's portion here in a minute, the closing remarks and future directions. And, uh, I think that would, would, uh, match along with what we're doing. I also like the, uh, quote, uh, MRC has people helping people indirectly by helping their animals. I really like the way you guys have answered uh, the common thing from the conference where people say, well, you know, why are you helping animals? Well, that's why we're helping animals. Um, if anybody else has other questions, put them into the chat function. I'm going to let Joss address some of those questions um, that we find in the chat. So we have one question that was asking about uh, the need for mental health support and OKMRC actually have a very, very efficient mental health support um, in disaster response, predominantly, obviously, it targets the general public, but it also is very critical for um, the members themselves. And we ourselves are very conscious of it. Uh, you saw the picture of the horses piled up. Yeah, that's going to have a, a distinct impact on pretty much anyone, even if you're somewhat familiar with it. Um, so it's very critical. We work together. We keep an eye on each other in deployments. And we follow the, the self care first and then your team and then the general public that's our criteria self first um, team and then public so yeah very very important to uh to have that uh, support mental health support in disasters like this um that's it for the actual questions Fantastic. that were verbally I provided you. i've i sorry I've, I've i've responded a lot on on written responses so if anyone else got a verbal question more than happy to respond to that um, I've got one question. Has the Pets Act benefited your NGO um, as such as for being eligible for FEMA grants? Did the Pets Act help you or hurt you? I don't really think it, it helped us as far as being available for grants or making grants available to us federally um, because we're large animal rather than small animal. Um, I think it has raised awareness um, generally, certainly when we go out to promote the group to our local emergency managers, we can cite pets and say, although that's targeting small animals, the same thing applies for large animals. Uh, and in that respect, I think the Pets Act has assisted us. Um, but financially, nah, it's not done us any favors. Understood. Well, Clayton, Joss, we greatly appreciate your presentation.